But let me say, we are here about to have yet another discussion. The case for diversity is it's almost overwhelming from a data standpoint. Just to set the scene, let me remind you. McKinsey, recent study, companies in the top quartile for gender diversity, 15% more likely to have financial returns that are above the national industry median. And companies in the top quartile for racial, ethnic diversity, 35% more likely to have financial returns above that median. Harvard Business Review reported that a team with a member who shares a client's ethnicity is 152% likelier than another team to understand that client. The results are stagnant and they're dismal. 4.2% of the S&P 500 CEOs are female, 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are African American, and the top 200 companies in the S&P 500 with at least one minority director decreased from 90% in 2005 to 86% in 2015. We have a problem still. Why did I pick up the New York Times this morning? To read that tonight, the most prestigious honor in the advertising and marketing business is the Hall of Fame. We're going to induct the first African-American woman creative director. The first. So let's get on with it. I'm with Kirk. I want to stop on the lip service and see what we can do. And so we have assembled an extraordinary, I just noticed I'm the only white girl up here, so that's, <laughs> that's a good start. Um, but uh, we're going to have some, some candid conversation. Um, with our panelists. Let me make sure that, that you know them. So Erica Irish Brown. Erica is Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Bloomberg LP. And Lucinda Martinez is the SVP of Multicultural and International Marketing uh, at HBO. And Justin Choi is the founder and CEO of Nativo. Uh, and Daisy Auger Dominguez, we have to congratulate Daisy. She is seven days into her new job uh, as SVP of Talent Acquisition at Viacom, uh, moving back to New York from, um, from Burlingame, Mountain View, Google, Alphabet. All good things. Okay, let's get at it. Where's my chair? Oh, so, am I, I think oh, we missed, I'm, I'm, oh, you know what, let's, no, yeah, let's move over This I'm way I don't have to do the swivel. I'm sorry, I didn't read the record. But I love your aggression. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say. Okay. Got it. Okay. So we haven't made much progress. A couple of data points about some of the regression that we've experienced. Let's just get at it. Why haven't we moved the needle? Daisy, okay. it's yours. Because, <laughs> yeah. because this is what I tell leaders. Uh, um, I, I'm day seven at Viacom, and prior to Viacom, I was at Google, which is why I'm moving back from the Bay Area. And my answer to leaders is because we lack the courage to do what we need to do organizationally. Um, we, the business case has been made. We, over and over and over we don't, again. We don't need to sit down in front of a leader and, and explain why um, diversity of thought, experience, and background, and your talent, and your practices, and your, and your processes is important. However, um, most organizations are still stuck in the traditional models of what talent looks like, what it behaves like, um, and, and how we select and, uh, and prepare and develop and advance talent in organizations. So courage, that's a, that's a very interesting, interesting thought. Let's hold that for a minute. Is that the way that you, you would also answer? Is it courage? I agree it's courage, but I also think it's how people make decisions, right? So to Daisy's point, what a leader looks like. People hire in their image. Um, leadership mm -hmm. is a very Western concept for many companies, mm -hmm. right? So they don't see leadership under different lenses. And, and people hire in their image. Plus the fact there is this pipeline of mid-level managers that are not diverse, that are in that pipeline to senior leadership. So even when you talk about courage and how you might mix things up in that middle management space or bring other people in, um, that causes disruption. Mm -hmm. Diversity is, is disruptive. And a lot of people resist disruption, even when they know it's the right thing to do and value disruption and innovation, it's still difficult to execute against. It's kind of interesting, though, because it, could you possibly name a time, uh, even historically, where 
every industry you could possibly think of is experiencing disruption. And to not, to not accept it or be involved with it, it just, it, it seems a little. I also think it's, uh, I also like to think courage, all that is true, but there's also a suspension of business logic <laughs> that I find incredibly mind boggling. Uh, because if you approached any part of your business and you looked at it and you try to solve a problem and you, were, and you looked at your audience, you looked at where your growth needs to come from, you look at where you've sort of tapped out and you analyzed and then you said, this is where I need to grow, that, in, if you look at it from a business standpoint, that diversity, diverse mindset, diversity in the people that are working, diverse audiences and targeting, is the most logical thing to do from a business standpoint. So I, I still find it astounding uh, that there's a suspension of business logic when it comes to diversity. And, um, and now I'm, I'm kind of looking at it with amusement because I think it's great. To me, that's a competitive advantage because before everybody wakes up, we're going to be doing really well. So I'm looking at it like, you know what? <laughs> Keep sleeping. Yeah, uh -huh. there you go. And we're gonna we're gonna get back to that. Sigue durmiendo de ese lado. Sorry, I saw somebody that speaks the language. <laughs> oh, that's even. Meet this a bilingual panel now. Now, yeah, now it's we're real. gonna go Spanglish. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, so, Erica, you lead uh, the uh, diversity efforts at uh, Bloomberg from a, a global standpoint. Can you talk about some of the things uh, that your company has done? to move the needle? Is it a process situation? What, how, how has Bloomberg moved the needle? Because you have, um, and I think we need to acknowledge that even though the, the numbers at large uh, don't look like we've moved the needle, there are certainly leadership uh, companies who have, and you certainly are one of them. Can you talk a little bit um, about the efforts inside the company? Sure. Well, one of the things that we've done is make it a business initiative. So it's not just HR driven. Mm -hmm. Every business leader has their own diversity inclusion business plan, and they focus on recruit, retain, develop. And we've also asked them to think outside the box. So what's your creative idea, right? What's different from the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling, and how do you address it that's unique to your aspect of our business? We have several different businesses at Bloomberg between news and media and software engineering. Well, you have how many employees products. globally? We have nearly 20,000 employees right. globally. Yep. So, and it is very global. 40% of those employees are outside of the U.S. So even how we define diversity is very broad and we tackle different issues. Uh, you know, we have a global strategy and then we attack it locally and put that local lens on it by region. Um, but the business plans are developed by the business. The business head presents it to our chairman and every six months checks in and gives a progress report on how they're tracking against their uh, goals that they've set for themselves. So it's their goals. It's not our mm -hmm. goals, it's not imposed. Nobody's being mandated to do things but create a plan and stick to it. So does meeting those goals, <coughs> is that wrapped into the compensation program? It's Bonuses not, or? It's not directly, you know, most, a lot of leaders will talk about you know, you have to tie it to compensation. Very few companies really do that effectively. Yeah, that, I was just curious. You, you know, so you can say that it's part of the performance management process. So we do have diversity and inclusion metrics in the evaluation process, and your evaluation can impact your compensation. Right, okay. But very few companies really have mm -hmm. a one to one, you know, stake in the ground around you know, this amount of money. And diversity is tied inclusion. to, yeah. So, so Daisy, I think seven days in at Viacom, you, <laughs> you probably can't talk too, too much um, about results, et cetera. So we'll toggle back and forth mm -hmm. between uh, Google and your current yes. role. But are the <coughs> kinds of things that Erica just described, were, were, were those very common also at, at Alphabet, at Google? It was, you know, and the tech industry is also, it's a nascent industry and in diversity and inclusion, very early stages. So, you know, we used to joke that, you know, Google's a bit of a teenager um, and still figuring its way, uh, especially in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, I think what, what Google did and what the tech industry has, has really put a stake in the ground is around transparency of data. Um, and so in 2014, Google was the first company to release our diversity numbers. And since then, almost every company in the Bay and beyond has started doing the same thing. And what that does is that it, it lends a level of transparency and accountability towards the work, not as much on, you know, not just uh, externally, but also internally. The demand that you get from employees when they see that yes. data, quite yeah. frankly, that was the biggest biggest pull for us. Employees constantly coming to us and saying, well, we know, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know these are the numbers, what can we do to advance it? But even within that, this year, because I know you, were, you, you wanted to get some tactical 
examples of what we've done. Um, this year, what, um, one of the initiatives that we put in place, which I think is, has the potential to be the most groundbreaking, is that we started presenting the data differently. Uh, and so traditionally, in most companies, and for a lot of legal reasons, we we're concerned about how we present demographic data. This year we presented our survey data. Um, instead of a, this is the experience of black employees and the other, we actually set it across all employees in every ethnic group. Because in tech in particular, diversity for some reason is only black and Hispanic. Nobody talks about Well, you know what's Asian. fascinating? I, I was doing a, a dinner, um, uh, we just started a, a board practice that mm -hmm. focuses on um, diversity and it was so interesting. I started talking about um, people of Indian descent, and they said in the valley they're not they're not considered diverse. No, no. Is because that... because demographically they are part of the majority employees. So it is it is it's a bit topsy turvy. And I've I've worked in media and finance, and this is the first time where we're talking about diversity in a very unilateral, very black black Hispanic and female. So what we did with the representation is that we actually we identified key questions in the survey that were particularly ja uh, jarring and, I and, and basically just did a line. And what we found consistently across the board was that white and Asian males were on the far right. They were doing great. They're loving life at Google. Life is fantastic. Mm -hmm. On the far end, you start black females are actually doing worse. And this is consistent across many industries. Then black males then Latinas and Latinos, and, and, and my Latino brothers and sisters, we tend to have sort of conflict with how we respond to surveys. So um, we tend to sound like we're okay and happy, but not quite. So a lot of, a lot of research has to, go, uh, has to go into that analysis. But what that did was that not only did we share that across the entire company, but we did then um, different groups throughout the organization when we brought in cross-sectional groups. So in the past, usually when you share this data, you bring in the employees of color and you tell them how bad right. life is for them. Well, what, you know, what we did was actually we're going to tell everybody how life is representing and how we're all experiencing the workforce. And what came out of those were real aha moments of white employees and Asian employees feeling the sense of, wait a second, you know, I, I, I'm doing okay. How come my, the, my colleague that's my next to me yeah. is struggling so much? And also within the Asian community, the first time that we started seeing a, dis, a disaggregation of experience and going like, you all think we're okay because we're numerically a majority, but we're still facing you know, a, a ceiling in terms of movement up the ranks. So, so I share that because we talk a lot about transparency and numbers, but even within that in organizations, we have an opportunity to tell a story, and mm -hmm. we're storytellers, to tell a story that truly drives impact and that truly speaks to where the change levers are for your organization. I think that, that it's absolutely fantastic. Stories are better than numbers in my book. Um, <laughs> Mr. Choi, you yes, have started a, at least three uh, companies <laughs> in the technology space. Uh, you are now the CEO of Nativo. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about building your teams, and, and I mean either on the executive team, the team at large, uh, or even your boards, how, how does diversity play in your mind in, into developing those teams? Well, I, I think one thing, so <clears throat> you, know, you, set, you started by saying the, the data is out there, the proof is out there. I, I'd say among executives that it's still undervalued. Mm -hmm. the, the data is undervalued. No, the, the fact that diversity matters is okay. undervalued. Mm -hmm. And I think that all this it, working in diversity kind of after the fact is when it feels disruptive. Mm -hmm. When from the very beginning, if we, if we more openly, including executives like me, really value and understand the importance of diversity, um, I think that gets reflected in our teams and gets built into the culture of the company. Now, can the industry at large do a better job? Yes, you know, our engineering team throws off the male-female ratios pretty handedly. Um, but, you know, I think valuing diversity, I still think we have to appreciate that it's underappreciated. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Um, well, I think, but that was also, um, to your point, Erica, is that we hire people in our own image, and, you know, therefore it, it is under, undervalued for sure. I mean, luckily for me, I, I, I don't, you know, it's not that uh, if I hired in my own image, I might run out of <laughs> candidates pretty quickly. Oh, you don't think men can do a good job in your company? <laughs> <laughs> you know, somehow they've survived. It's, they've done okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I saw pretty quickly early on, you know, I think if you're very open-minded and, and really look at things the way they transpire, you see how differing opinions you can't make a good decision without different perspectives. 
thousand percent. And, and at the executive level, then you could maybe avoid things like tone deaf commercials that damage mm -hmm. your brand mm -hmm. because you didn't have the right makeup of people look at the creative or be a part of the process. So, you know, really for me, building the companies, I saw very early on um, that having a diverse pool of perspectives to draw from was a key to success, a major key to success. So, you know, there's... I'm there's, sorry, oh, I add, go, go. My, in my last role <laughs> at, at Google, um, I was working with the Alphabet companies, and that was exactly the message that we gave to all, and these are essentially all small startups. And the first question that many leaders would ask me is, well, how does Google do it? And I would say to them, stop. We don't want to do it how Google did it, because Google made a lot of mistakes. And we're basically going back and fixing a lot of things. You get to shape the culture, and you get to shape who this organization is going to be with your first 50 hires. So really, what we're going to think about instituting diversity and inclusion without it having to be a standalone practice, without it having to be, you don't have to hire a chief diversity officer, you, 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 your budget is too small to even think about that, is how do we start integrating this from the early onset so that, to your point, the belief in this as a business driver is, is early on and you're not having to go back and redress mistakes and you're not going back to reshift the culture because your culture is already embedded with a diversity and inclusion lens. Right. right, and the only other thing I'd say when you talk about that decision making, there is discourse when you have diversity, right? And a lot of people don't like that discourse. And, well, because it's uncomfortable. And, mm -hmm. Right, it's uncomfortable. And diverse teams are absolutely harder to manage. Yes. So, you know, so that's can, the other Can you thing. talk about that a little bit? I think that's a really important point. Yeah, you know, because you have that discourse, because you have the different approaches and different opinions and different lenses to place on the decision-making process, it can be tough to reconcile all of those different views and to manage a team effectively. So then it also comes down to leadership, right? Because if you're not a leader that can lead across difference and be inclusive and help facilitate that decision-making process, actually the team could actually break down just the same. So diverse teams are harder to manage, and I think it's important mm -hmm. to put that out there but they are much higher performing if you manage mm -hmm. them effectively. That's right. So, you know, that's the other thing that I think is really important, but it comes down to leadership, and a lot of leaders do not lead, you know, and a lot of leaders do not invest in their people and the performance of their team, and that's something that, um, you know, I'm trying to make sure that we encourage at Bloomberg that leaders really lead and bring out the best of all their people, which does not mean treat treating everybody the same. Well, and I think, I think that's an absolutely critical point. Um, it, it's not about treating everybody the same, um, particularly when people are paid on, on performance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's giving everyone the opportunity um, to perform, That's is right. sort of the way that, that yeah. I yes. look at it. But, right. you know, this is, uh, it, it's so true of boards also. Mm -hmm. um, the lack of, of diversity on boards, it is absolutely, I mean, I've got, my head is full of, of those facts. And the, again, the, the data supporting the importance of diversity on boards has to do with the discussion. Mm -hmm. And the discussion, you know, forgive me, but a bunch of, you know, white men over 65 sitting around talking about, you know, the fate of a, a company um, in a world that knows nothing except disruption right now. It's, I've sat on a couple of those boards and it is absolutely remarkable. It is absolutely remarkable, mm -hmm. and you know, if a fish thinks from the head, um, then board leadership is a—it's—it's it's a major, major issue. Um, Justin, because you have the opportunity to to invent cultures and invent boards, um, and I don't know whether this is true because it, you, you know you're much more in an entrepreneurial world where your board members, at least to begin first uh, four, five, six, seven years are usually your, your right. finance right. Uh, guys, your VCs, et cetera. Um, have you observed some of these things on, on boards? Do you think about that a lot as you put companies together? Who's on that board and, and what it means? For you know, we, we are getting to the size where we're starting to have to think about those things, really. So to your point, you know, the early investors, um, largely dictate who's on the board, and you guys could probably guess the makeup of Silicon Valley <laughs> investors, yeah. um, and you'd be 100% Yeah, correct. they don't wear the great heels that are on this. <laughs> uh, our today. shoe game in our board <laughs> game. Um, but, uh, but we're having to look at that, and, and really we approach it first from definitely diversity of thought, but also we're not quite at perhaps this size yet, but I think it's incumbent upon Silicon Valley boards and investors to realize that as companies grow, and they're no longer startups, 
that these conversations, these perspectives become more and more important. You look at some of the most successful startups out there and the challenges they're facing now, right. because they didn't yes. value diversity, because they didn't seek this out early, I think that if I'm on that board, the lesson here is that, hey, as these companies progress, I just can't be looking at numbers and making sure everything goes left and to the, up and to the right. I have to be thinking about, hey, what do we, what do we represent as we grow as a company? Mm -hmm. What go. kind of diversity do we have to have? So I think that's a transition, but I think that's now becoming uh, clear to Silicon Valley that that's the kind of thing that you really have to be mindful of as you grow as a business. Well, I, I hope so. Um, Lucy, you have done some amazing investment uh, at HBO in um, diversity of programming, and thank you very much, by the way, for Big Little Lies, if you didn't see it. Oh, isn't that great? Yes. Uh, and Night, Night Of uh, was also, I loved that one, Insecure, Confirmation, so many great shows. Um, who's behind that thinking there? What has it done to the, to the business? I think you... Uh, have been very, very careful to measure results in a number mm -hmm. of different different ways. Can you talk about HBO's programming? Yeah, so the first thing is that at HBO, um, the brand, right, and what it stands for, um, and the business model sort of dictates sort of the kind of things we put on air and then how we market it and then how we bring it to market. So we're a premium network. you got to pay extra. Um, you now have bills that exceed $200, right, a month, and we don't know how that happened, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. and because HBO is a driver of these packages, they tend to package us in in very expensive sort mm -hmm. of right. um, packaging because bundles. they know it drives, and bundles because they know it drives, it drives sales. So, um, what we are are storytellers at our best, so the whole idea is that um, you're going to see a story told in a way, in a perspective, with cast and production values that you will not see anywhere else. And so that's where we start. Um, and, and, and where did that come from? Who really that came from, beat you know, the drum on this? You know, it's interesting because if you look at our data, again, I, I'm very much data driven. Um, I'm very much about not having suspension of business logic. Um, doesn't matter how much we spend on original programming, the driving reason why people sign up for HBO is still movies. And it's very fascinating, yeah. right? Um, but the premium is the halo, but the original programming is the halo of the brand, right? That's the stamp. Because movies in the end, once their window ends, you're gonna see it everywhere else. But, when, but that, that availability of all that content is the real reason that people enter to the door. And then you have these aberration of content um, that we have had a few of, which was Sopranos at its height. Right. Now with Game of Thrones, you've had about two or three properties that there, it, it, it solved, it, it just, takes everything else out the door, which is the moment that show goes on, there is nothing else anyone's watching but those particular shows, and we're enjoying that now with Game of Thrones, and Westworld came in bigger mm -hmm. than any That's show we have ever launched, and that, that, that show is crazy. And, um, and I gotta tell you, season two is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That, so that's the fun part. I get to sit in the meetings. Like I know everything. That I've read every script for Game of Thrones. I've read every worst role script. And I, also, and I usually even, I even have to read the stuff I don't like. So, um, so that's really exciting. And then, the, then what you do is you take that um, and you, how do we, so we are storytellers. And then when it's time to market, we are story sellers. And that's the way we do it. So every single campaign has a distinctive feel um, and, it, and, and way that we go to market. So I just wrapped, literally this week, and I'm so glad I wrapped it, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, yeah. so when you get a film Beautiful. starring Oprah Winfrey, written by George Wolf, um, and, and you get a cast like that with a story like Henrietta Lacks, speaking of diversity, that no one knew that everything, every advance in medicine, the reason why we are here, the reason why we're sitting here and sitting well, is because this black woman from Baltimore they, who had cervical cancer, they took her cells without her permission, and those were the first times that cells were able to grow outside of the body, which allowed for experimentation of cells outside of human specimens. And that allowed for everything, even down to your nail polish, your lipstick, we can thank Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. So you get a story like that, and you're gonna take it to market. What do you do with something like that? So what we did is we decided that we not only had a, an opportunity to promote a show, but we also had a responsibility. So even in the research, again, fact-based, we stopped, we did our research. We, we couldn't believe that despite that this movie was based on an award of uh, 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 New York Times best-selling, sold yep. millions and millions of copies, we were astounded about the amount of people that still didn't know who Henrietta Lacks. And even further surprised about how many people of color 
didn't know who Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. So we realized that we needed to go out to market not just with, oh, look, this great movie based on a book, but this is somebody who you should know, and at the end of this campaign, we want everybody to say her name. Mm -hmm. And that's literally the entire plan. So we created what we called a Gila exhibit. And we sourced, we hired a curator, we sourced um, art that was made from all sorts of, um, that had been created, curated, and we had a traveling exhibit that went from city to city okay. with the trailer of the movie, with the book, with the author, with George Wolf, and we ended in D.C. at the Smithsonian um, African American Culture Museum, and we screened it in front of the Henrietta Lacks family in the Oprah Winfrey Theater. Like, you, you can't get better than that. <laughs> yeah. and, um, right. and I'm waiting for the ratings. Like, I'm sitting here, like, I live like, <laughs> what was the rating? What was the rating? So yeah, so that, um, so at its core, it's what does the story represent? How do we sell this story? Um, how do we do this in a way that simply is, it takes marketing to another level now, because now it's just about education. Absolutely fantastic. Ratings. We need to improve our ratings in this area. The ratings are not good. So what do we need to do? So I'll, I'm making a commitment. I set up this board placement practice focusing on this, and I'm running around this country talking about it, but also doing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying. What else can, can all of us do? What are you doing um, as individuals as well as uh, through your companies, are we missing something? I think first it's, um, again, do not suspend business logic. Like, look at your business, where's your growth? Yeah. The second thing is culture, right? Create a culture um, where, um, where diversity sort of thrives mm -hmm. and ensure that the business outcome you're trying to create is future-proof. But I find that the most important thing of having diversity in a room is not simply about what you need to do sometimes. The most important conversations I've ever had in my, in my company is what they shouldn't do. The amount of shit right. <laughs> that could have walked out that door if I didn't raise my hand and <laughs> yeah. say, you don't want to go that yeah. route, and let me tell you why, that could backfire. And having the courage and working for a CEO like Plepler, like yeah. Richard Plepler, who, who, who his entire thing, he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yep. Absolutely. So, I'm, so, so, you know, Lucinda, you tell us, um, I work for you. What do you need me to do to make something out? And then, and then you actually have the courage to say it. And five times out of, no, eight times out of ten, he doesn't really want me to tell him. Yeah. So I just wait for the, the other two Find times. Right. Yeah. You well, got to know that timing when he's ready. <laughs> what, what else should we all be doing? Well, one of the things we're doing at Bloomberg that I think could be of interest here is we're trying to make sure when it comes to our news and media that we have diverse voices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you think about the number of, you know, white male voices that are sources for story, sources yes. for information, sources of opinions, you don't get the diversity of opinion and the mm -hmm. perspective that comes with that diversity. So if you really want to report news a certain way, well, you need female voices, vo voices. You need diverse voices. You need sources. The sources and the stories and what people are talking about in different communities and around gender and race, et cetera, they have different opinions. And that goes back to responsibility. And, and Right. That's right. exactly right. And the quality of the content, the quality of the product and the output. So uh, we've taken that very seriously. And actually, in Asia, we created a tool where we can really measure it. So in October, we were quoting uh, men 14 times to every one female quote. And now we've cut that in half or increased women by you know, 100%, basically. So, um, and, and, and when we look at you know, what are the hits on our news, you know, most of our content is driven through our 325,000 terminal users in the financial services markets. But when we look at how that content is performing and how it's transformed right. and even the diversity of the topics, all under the business umbrella. So we're still talking mm -hmm. about corporate business Business news. imperatives, absolutely. That's right. But, you know, with different topics and different angles. And, and we've, we've seen that improvement. And we've been able to measure it. Very specifically, we've worked on it in Asia because we, we have a strong tool there. And we're going to roll it out. Any other thoughts on what we should, what we should be doing? I, I think as a tech, the tech community, the, one of the um, things I love about being in tech is that it, it can be an accelerant, right? So you can have an idea. <laughs> And in five years, you know, you're this large platform that reaches all of these people. 
And I think that um, in a lot of ways that's also a career accelerant for anyone who's mm -hmm. part of that early team. And I think what I'm seeing more of and I'm excited about is more female founders and more diversity mm -hmm. and people getting funded. Because one of the things in Silicon Valley that you heard a lot of was pattern matching, yes. pattern recognition, which is mm -hmm. another yes. word for stereotyping. Mm -hmm. And as you, found, as you fund more of those um, entrepreneurs and they find success, then you have more candidates for boards and people who yes. kind of go, just accelerate right past the corporate culture and really showcase their capabilities uh, on a wider stage. So I, I'm really excited about getting more diversity of um, uh, company founders funded. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's and you can also point. leverage technology for diversity oh, as absolutely. well, right? So, you know, so actually through Bloomberg Great Beta, point. we invested yeah. in a company that actually is creating blind resumes mm -hmm. for our hiring managers Excellent. to evaluate for open positions. Yep. So Excellent. we've been trying to leverage technology to take some of the, you know, human element and unconscious mm -hmm. and bias that exists yeah. out of the hiring process. I know. We didn't even, we didn't even get yeah, we didn't. to. <laughs> yeah. but I, I know. I had, I had eight million. <laughs> you know, we, we, could, we could stay here for hours. Are you guys busy this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> It's we could, so we could talk about this forever. <laughs> okay. I was, I was actually going to okay. mention the, all, the all unconscious day, bias day. piece. Um, yeah. I think that whether you're an individual contributor or a leader, um, you all can do something. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and it really is, is also acknowledging that this requires will and skill. Um, and so the will piece is acknowledging that you're going to do something, that you know, is, is, is looking around the room, looking around your teams, looking around the organizations, and being able to acknowledge have the courage, being able to, to speak up when, when, when you recognize that there are voices that are being missed from a campaign, from a story, from an idea. Um, but then the skill piece is where this unconscious bias piece comes in. My, my last training at, at um, Google was actually with the X team. And X is really, I, I used to also work at Disney, so I used to call X the Imagineers of Google. It really <laughs> is where like, all of the great creation comes in. And these are some of the most brilliant, brilliant minds. I mean, talk about, and just you know, just, they are rocket scientists, um, and and yet in their day to day, their you know the, the their unconscious bias that came into everything that they did was limiting their ability to actually be the team that they wanted to be, and eventually will be the will be the um, the distractor and the limitation from them to create the next innovative idea. And so so thinking about both the will and the skill, um, and thinking about you know how do you how do you address both. And how do you build the right data sets to you know to be informed? But I think the last the last piece that we were um, that we were really stressing at Google, mostly from the leadership lens and mostly from the white male technology leadership lens at Google, was around lending your privilege. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And this is an expression that's that's sort of taking form now, and folks are using it more commonly. But is is acknowledging that again, no matter who you are in your in, in in your organization, unless you're a very junior person of color, you've got some privilege that you can lend to folks. And that means creating space for someone to speak that hasn't been allowed to speak. That means speaking up for someone who, who isn't in the room and should be. Um, and that means acknowledging the voices that are absent and are missing. Um, and so we were spending a lot of time in uh, encouraging and building that skill for leaders to really lend their privilege in a way to, uh, to truly harness the talent that are in organizations. And we forget it. And we forget it. I mean, we, we have tremendous privilege. And one of the things that I do when I go to team meetings is that usually I'm usually late going to team meetings. And my team would always leave the front of the, the, the table open, open for me. And I would purposely sort of go in and move the table around. I was like, I don't need to sit at the head of the table. It does, I'm, I'm like everybody else here. You know, yes, fundamentally, at the end of the day, the decisions you know, that, I, that I make are the ones that we're going to decide, but we're going to do this collectively. And it's shifting that mindset so that folks start thinking differently. Um, and decisioning happens differently when you do that. Wow, we could go on and on and on. But I am so grateful to have all of you here for this discussion. Um, I hope once again, um, that we have, have showed in a small way how very important it is for all the right reasons. Um, and if that's not clear, um, it is all about a business imperative. It's good for business and it's smart for business. So besides the multicultural, well, I'm speaking being a Latina and being a female, um, <laughs> I wanted to know also... two Latinas on a panel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to know your opinion on the wage gap also, because I think we haven't talked about this, and I think it's very important for, I guess, everybody in the room, not just for the females, but I guess all these men are going to have daughters one day, and they want to know 
all this. Let's hope so we solve it by then, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know your perspective being the leaders uh, on this discussion. You're not Mike, so wage I've got gap, an wage gap. Wage, 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 compensation gap. Oh, I mean, I'll, 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 I was going to say, oh. I'll just start, right, because I can tell you some of the work that companies are doing around it, right? And some of it is voluntary, and some of it, frankly, they're being asked to. So if you're a company based in the UK, right, you've been told you have to report this data now. Um, but a lot of companies are taking a look at it. So they're doing the analysis. They're looking at it across job codes, et cetera, and trying to address it. And there have even been uh, you know, stories in the news about the cost of closing that wage gap, which is typically not insignificant. So I mean, you know, does it exist? Absolutely. And, and even if you want to break it down even more so than just gender male versus female, but if you want to get into Latinas, African American women, then you see even greater disparity very often, right? So, and, and then, you know, you have to slice and dice it based on the industry, what the roles are, what the level of education is, but does it exist? Absolutely. Are, are, do I think people like myself are doing the analysis and trying to make sure it doesn't exist at their companies? I think that as well. And then personally, what I do why not tell her, right? I hire the law firm that represents the white guys in my company. <laughs> so I make sure I get their money. <laughs> you got to check. So not everybody can hire the lawyers. <laughs> so I, I was going to give a, the, the practical because, um, like Erica mentioned, and, and again, you know, if you've read the news, I come from, from Google, so we'll, we won't talk about that. But, the, but, I, but I do know the analysis that went into uh, to the work and, and the, effort, the, the tremendous efforts that, that went into equalizing wages across the organization. The challenge is, is that we carry legacy of salaries and compensation. And so what you can do individually is be, make sure that you're not being measured by your last salary, but what the role that you're applying for, getting promoted into, moving yeah. into, what, that, what the market demands for that role. And that's hard, and it's really hard. Listen, I just took a new job, and, and, even, and I'm taking a job in talent acquisition, and I ended up hiring my own lawyer because I was like, I didn't want to negotiate with my future boss because it's, it's uncomfortable. But here's the thing, if you don't do it, you're talking about the lack of wealth accumulation for yourself and your family in the future. So if that helps, at least that's what I, that's what I think about my daughter and her college <laughs> degree and what I need to do. So for all of you, any role that you go into, don't be, don't be mindful of, and, and when you're hiring, and when you're hiring and when you're thinking of positions, it's not about what the person was making before, it's about what the current job demands. Other question, yep, please. So I'm just a white Jewish guy from New York. <laughs> and How's it, how, how does it feel to become be, be potentially an endangered species? Uh, it's fine. <laughs> Work hard, play hard, and that's all that matters. But um, something that I've done is when I interview someone, I'll come around the other side of the desk so we can be equals. I'm not out to play an authoritative figure to someone, even colleagues. I think that sets a balance that is appropriate that, uh, you know, I'm not out to prove anything and I want to have that kind of personal communication with anybody that I hire. Great. I do a lot of hiring huh? for the company that I represent. Oh. And one thing that I do is when I'm looking at information that's coming from headhunters, I take away the amount of salary and performance that that person was getting prior because I don't give a crap because whomever I'm hiring is getting the same amount of money that that job demands. That's a big and party. that's it. Yeah. And when I was hired by this company, and I'm C-level, so there are not many in the tech world, I got more money than a man would have gotten in this position because I demanded it, and that's it. Yeah. And, and we should be colorblind, we should be race blind, ethnicity blind, sexually blind, but that's gonna age out because the people that are growing up are smarter than us, mm -hmm. and they see things differently than we do. But it's really, we can't just talk. You've gotta, as hiring managers, as, as people of decision-making ability, you have to just do it and say, this is the world now, and we have to represent it properly inside our own business. So you've said so many key things. I want to say you know, a couple of things. So even the legislative environment is changing, right? So there is legislation that says that now you can't ask, you know, in New York, you can't ask for salary history. So that is something that's evolving real time. The other thing I would say, and I know exactly what you mean, but even when you talk about race blind, color blind, sexual orientation blind, actually, you know, for me and what I do, I want you to see it and value it, right? You know, so I know exactly what you mean, so I don't 
I don't mistake it at all. But you know, what I do want to say to this room is really, you know, when you when you shift the paradigm and you value that difference and see what it brings to the culture of the company, what perspectives it brings and what it offers, that's really when you also can assign appropriate value for that individual, the role they play at your company, and et cetera. Great. We'll take one more. One more. Okay. I have two genes to choose from. <laughs> Hang on. Jean and then Jean. One, two. Hi, I'm Jean Howling with Tremor Video. Um, one thing I'm really proud of at our company is we have phenomenal diversity statistics. And But one thing I'm struggling with is I want to bring people from outside my company into my company and take people from my company outside of my company to learn more with external mentor mentorship or networking groups or things like that that help grow that middle layer to have greater strength and bring up the whole entire industry. Do you have recommendations of groups that I should be looking into, becoming a member of, or bringing into my company? One of the organizations that our chairman, Peter Grauer, is the uh, US chair of is a 30% club. So specifically for gender diversity, the 30% club does have a cross-company mentoring program uh, that's done really well and has focused on uh, diversity at the more senior levels, but specifically gender diversity. There's, there's lots of organizations, so I'm, I'm happy to share them. It's, a, it's actually a long list you know, of, of networks and organizations that have mentoring programs. Hi, uh, I'm also Jean. I work at Pugmatic. Uh, first, thanks so much for coming and speaking. I think it's really nice to see people vocalize and bring the conversation to surface. Um, it, I took away from your chat that there's kind of these two pieces uh, to tackle the problem, which is um, about awareness um, and also about um, taking, I guess, conscious uh, ch changes. Um, so my question is really around, um, you know, yes, it's great. Let's everything starts with a bit of awareness. We're not perfect, but let's start with a bit of consciousness and see where it goes. Um, so what can we do? And I think, Daisy, you spoke about some tactical things. What can we do tactically to um, enhance the, and change the thinking and mindset of people and um, increase the consciousness, I suppose? And I think some folks did mention a few different tactical things, but yeah, that's my question. What can we tactically do? Well, I'll, okay, I'll... Uh, no, well, this is a small tactic that I'm aware of and just just as a practical matter you know the different specifically to gender they can have different approaches to things like salary negotiation mm -hmm. and even just how they view um, um, responsibility given certain situations and outcomes and I, I think part of it is just being as as male managers being very aware that the genders can take different approaches to things and, and maybe not raise their hand as much. And so I think tactically what we do at our company is that we, we try to remove unnecessary subjectiveness from uh, setting salaries and, and pay scales. And that helps across all kinds of factors, not just, not just the gender side. So I think uh, a tactical approach, if I was advising another startup entrepreneur, would be look, to say, you really sit down and map out what salaries mean and what they represent and take out who was the person raising their hand, what did they get paid before, so that you have something that is much more uh, objective and really more fair. So that would be a tactical note. This is, I'll pass it over, this is a quick one and it's, and it's gotten a lot of attention, but structured interviews, <laughs> they reduce bias. And especially in our industry, we go so much by the subjective feeling of how someone makes you feel, who they know, the relationships that they have in the market, which in some cases, it's about bringing business. But one tactical solution is, and it doesn't have to be when you think of the tech companies and all these rubrics and all this, these things that they have, it's actually just having a systemic approach to hiring that is consistent and fair and equitable across the board. So if you're interviewing five people, they all go through the exact same process. Um, very simple, does not have to be overly complicated. It can help you reduce bias in your selection process. And that applies to people moving internally as well, right? Because a lot of the senior most positions are actually being filled by that leadership pipeline. So was that candidate slate diverse? Have you thought about the talent there? Or even have you done the right amount of planning to know that this leader needs to develop these skills or have these five experiences in order to be ready for this role or that role? So some of it is being deliberate and intentional around 
talent and leadership for your company. You know, the other thing that I would say is lead by example. Very often, um, people don't role model the behavior they expect to see in the rest of senior leadership at their company. So, you know, the two individuals sitting here talked about how they role model that behavior and the actions that they take. People see that actions and people replicate the actions they see their leaders, you know, the, the qualities that they exhibit. So, you know, if you're on a global call and somebody's on the speakerphone, do you actually ask, does anybody, you know, from Asia have a comment to make, right? Because they're sort of this hidden group of people on the on the polycom that maybe you haven't spoke, you know, spoken to them. Or are you even sensitive around what time you've scheduled that call? Right? Because it might just be noon here, but that means it's, you know, midnight there. Or even did you start by the good morning, good afternoon, good evening, right? That's inclusive leadership. If you do that, then your team and the other, you know, your peers will likely start doing that. So a lot of it's also role modeling the behavior that signals that you're an inclusive company. And the last thing I would, I would say is that if you look at where and how diversity can be impacted, there are three areas. It's workforce, right? So who are the current people in your workforce that are, that, that, that are there and can make some immediate impact? There's workplace, which is sort of, who, that's retention, that's the people that are there now. Are you identifying the people that could be um, an opportunity for growth um, in that plan? And then there's marketplace, right? So the marketplace is who are your customers? Who are you trying to sell this to? Who are you trying, what are you trying to grow? In what areas are you trying to go and grow? And then make sure that your workforce and your workplace is a place where these guys can thrive and help you then reach your marketplace goals. If you don't handle those three, um, then, or you can't, it's a three-legged stool, like you can't do one and not the other two or vice versa, because it's not gonna happen. I don't know about you guys, but amen. That kind of felt religious. <laughs> so thank you again.